On this episode of the Philosophy Society podcast, I talk with James Clark. Now, James is a clinical psychologist and PhD candidate at Murdoch University. So we talk about quite a serious range of issues in this episode, mainly issues that have got to do with the intersection between psychology and philosophy. So these include the concept of no self, the role of philosophy in psychology, when philosophical questioning goes too far, uh, understanding the nature of conscious experience, especially the conscious experiences of others, displaying empathy and sympathy, and the importance of the free will versus determinism debate in the psychological setting and our everyday lives. So without any further ado, I bring you James Clark. Something I've always wondered is the extent to which psychological interventions and psychological diseases are kind of dependent upon philosophical problems. But if you said that, like, in some cases people were, you know, anxious because of, like, some sort of nihilistic philosophy or something like that, I can imagine that being a particular case, even if it's not common. Mm. If that person like came in, they would need to test out the ideas that are in their head mm. without being like held accountable for every single mm. word that they said. And mm. like I can imagine that being like a huge source of like anxiety for someone that's coming into some sort of like psychological therapy. Yeah, definitely. I mean that's that's one of the things that people want most when they see somebody is that they know that, that conversation doesn't leave those four walls. And they can then test out ideas or, or connect with experiences that they can't have in everyday life or with their partner at home or, or family or something like that. So they use that therapy space as a way of, you know, first contacting them, you know, with the understanding that they could leave and nobody will ever know about what they said there. I know this is like an area of interest because I believe you're doing your PhD in this like what you just said the conversation doesn't leave those four walls now correct me if i'm wrong you're doing your phd in the effect of psychotherapy on psychologists mm. yeah so yes yeah, yeah. so like what sort of effect would that very particular thing have mm. on psychologists like you're having these like you're encountering probably deep complex issues all the time you're dealing with this like deep deep problems at times and you like you there's some sort of like what do you call it like secrecy or confidentiality confidentiality yeah. that's the word yeah. um like what sort of effect does that have on you I, I guess i should say there are exceptions to confidentiality and there are a couple of important important ones if you're working in a multidisciplinary team like i do then there is, you know, I'm very open with clients to begin with saying that we need to share information about what we're working on, that sort of thing to coordinate, you know, appropriate service and that sort of stuff. With always the understanding that if there's something that that person doesn't want shared, that, you know, that will be kept. Um, other exceptions would be around supervision. So we're all expected to be seeing somebody who's more senior than us uh, to consult with about the clients that we see to make sure that we're providing the best service and the only way you can do that is to talk about the clients. Um, and then of course if there's issues of risk, you know, like someone's gonna kill themselves or kill somebody else or, or something like that, then, but even then you're still trying to maintain as much confidentiality as possible because as soon as you, if you break confidentiality when they don't want you to, um, then you really risk, you really jeopardise the relationship with that client. And so I imagine that would also jeopardise the relationship, not just with you and the client, but with the client and potential psychologist yes. going into the future. Yeah, exactly. And it's very common. And um, well, common is probably the wrong word, but it's it's not uncommon to meet somebody who has maybe had some issues of trust with whether it's a psychologist or just a health professional in general because of previous experiences they've had with either like a counsellor or a psychologist or uh, just somebody else that was in that position of need, you know, being the one to provide help but doing that inappropriately or at worst abusing that trust. 
so yeah it is right if you screw that up then you do jeopardize that future for that person too so i'm going to bring us back because we 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 skipped that yes one. yeah what's the sort of effect that mm-hmm. that being a psychologist has on a psychologist yeah are we recording by the way yes we are okay all right cool. <laughs> just edit that a little bit out <laughs> The effect of being a psychologist on a psychologist. So that's a real, there's a lot to say with that. I think there's positive and negative effects and just neutral effects as well. I think the good things about the work is that you can, you certainly grow a lot personally and you learn a lot more about yourself and the world in general as well Uh, and I think it definitely expands your capacity to provide empathy to people but at the same time and I guess when I talk about the negatives it depletes that as well so it's almost like it it makes your fuel tank you know your empathy fuel tank bigger but then drains it yeah as part of the work and that can have flow-on effects if it's not managed right that can totally have flow on effects like you can start to maybe not be as empathic to the people in your personal life as you would be you know to clients or uh maybe you find yourself pulling away from certain relationships um or pulling away from certain things like for me i noticed that i would like my choice in media consumption changed a lot you know not necessarily the mediums of of the media but the content of it like you know i would always be attracted to things that are a bit more dark and gritty that kind of stuff whereas starting the work you then need to there's more of a need to listen to or watch comedies or or things like that you know stuff that's music that um isn't as dark necessarily you know, and it's almost like you're counterweighting the experiences that you've had throughout the day. You know, it's like you're trying to achieve this homeostasis in a way. When you like encounter clients that are suffering with different sorts of problems, do you find it like, because as far as I'm aware, there's kind of like two ways that, or two different things that you could see, and you might, you probably see both of them at the same time, but you would see just like suffering, but then you would also see like a distinctive human story in encountering and dealing with that suffering. So like, do you try to see only one of those things? Like, do you try to just look at the fact that this person's like coming up against it and fighting it or like is there some sort of like dark element that you just can't remove just like some sort of like unnecessary suffering that you just wish didn't exist Mm. I guess what you're getting at there is in a way and I'm using the term philosophy a bit loosely like I guess your perspective on therapy or life in general like that sort of philosophy of therapy that really plays into it like in terms of what you see as the things that make a difference the mechanisms of change just how you i guess your your view of the world um that goes into that moment and how you actually can sit with some of those really dark experiences but not be overwhelmed by them um so I think in that moment, it depends on what it is, but there are certainly times where you, where there's a story that you take on board, you know, and, and it affects you, of course. And in a way, how could it not? You know what I mean? I think one of the important parts about, one of the biggest predictors of positive outcomes in um, psychotherapy is the connection between the client and the therapist. So, what we call the therapeutic relationship. So, that's, you know, in many ways a real relationship. So, I think that you have to experience that. You have to be open to it, be experiencing that emotion and sit with it. Otherwise, in a way, I guess another aspect of that is that the client isn't going to be soothed. 
if, if you aren't responding with compassion and empathy that's genuine, people will see that, people will feel that, and it won't do anything for that distress. It will make it worse, probably. It's almost like the good old, you know, psychology for people like me that haven't done psychology. It's like, <laughs> you know, sometimes people just need to share their story, but that's like when you say share your story, it's not just just tell someone else your story. It's sometimes it's literally you're sharing the burden of that story at yeah. the same time. Yeah. I'm really interested because you said that you need to sit with it. Mm. And I guess being able to sit with those sorts of things, like that, that's, I guess that's an element of Eastern philosophy and meditation. Mm-hmm. Is there something else that you do besides like sit with it to sort of deal with those particular scenarios? Yeah, I think in the moment you're looking to provide that compassion to that person and that genuine empathy so that that individual's emotional needs are getting met in that moment, so that need to be understood and cared for, obviously with appropriate boundaries, you know, Um, because that is what, when somebody's distressed and there's, I guess, you know, you're dipping into attachment theory here around um, how humans develop and I guess the evolutionary basis to that. But essentially, without going into a lot of that stuff, when humans are distressed, they seek comfort from uh, somebody that is a, you know, a caregiver. Um, and what calms that distress, not just in an experiential level, but actually on a biological level, is the experience of compassion and understanding. And uh, I guess a return to feeling safe and secure. So if somebody, and this is just in, you'll notice in every relationship of your life. And in that way, the therapy relationship is no different. So you're just trying to do what a human would do to another human in an ideal world, but you're doing it for people who have often not experienced that, maybe ever, or maybe only just a few times. So it's even more important that they get that experience. So it's that display of empathy for the client, but you personally, like, how do you deal with that? Mm. Because like, like you've said, like there would be times where it's like, for lack of a better word, like dark, like what you're hearing Mm. is like, can be dark stories I can imagine. So Mm. how would you deal with that? Is it just a matter of like, learning to like sit with it learning to mm. meditate on it learning to like experience and not let it like control and dominate you or is there some sort of more like active thing that you do besides like the passive like being able to um, receive it mm. I guess there's a couple of things with that I think in the moment it's like you you build up a muscle over time that I remember the first time working with a client and hearing like a really difficult story you the emotional I guess the depth of emotion that I experienced in the moment with the client was much deeper than maybe now Um, and I think you just it's almost like you build up a bit of a a filter you know I'm not going to say a screen because it's not like you're stopping yourself from feeling that stuff or connecting with it you're still connecting with it but you develop this capacity to to sit with it without being so affected by it overwhelmed by it but also not going too much the other way where you're disconnected and you're not present with the person so it's it's almost like your capacity to experience that just grows and 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 develops is that something that you're trained to do or is that something that psychologists just have to learn to do like is there specific techniques for that i think mostly it's something that you just develop with experience but i think there are things that people do particularly to help them if they are feeling really overwhelmed and it varies from person to person some people might do like imagery exercises like they might um you know imagine that you know, there's almost like a literal kind of force field around them that they whatever they're receiving isn't can't penetrate. You know, um, whether that's a client that's you know perhaps 
um, upset with you as, as a therapist and, you know, maybe devaluing you or putting you down or something like that, or whether it's just an overwhelming connection with what's going on. Uh, so other people might, yeah, use other imagery things like <clears throat> imagine they're rather than being in the experience, they're kind of, um, I guess the difference between if you imagine yourself going to watch a movie is the difference between being in the, the movie or, you know, being sitting in one of the chairs and watching it. You kind of just sort of harnessing that mental imagery. For me though, personally, what I would do if, if I'm having a reaction that is feeling like it could ha might have the potential to, to come out in an unhealthy way, <clears throat> I, you know, I think that's where I draw upon my own sort of meditation training in being able to sit in, in an observer space and observing what's going on. And that just sort of helps take me out of it a little bit to be able to just watch and, and create the space to be able to hold that emotional experience. Is that like kind of changing tax a little bit? Is that meditation also something that you teach your clients to do regarding their own experiences? Where it's relevant. So it most aligned mindfulness. I mean, mindfulness has really come into vogue recently. And yeah, that, you can say that again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it get and I guess that my problem is that sometimes it gets presented like it's a cure all for everything, and it's not that at all. You know, and I think sometimes when you just look at the technique itself without placing it in a an appropriate context so that a person knows why they're doing the, th the mindfulness exercise and what it's about, um, then it, if, they, if they're not doing that, then it, I don't think it has much chance of being that effective. You know, if it's just like you've heard, oh, mindfulness is good for stress, so I'm going to sit and do a mindfulness exercise for 10 minutes a day. You know, sure, that might help for some people, but some, if you're trying to work with somebody who's got some you know, serious mental health concerns, um, I, I feel like it needs to be attached to something a bit more broader than that. And so there are models of therapy that really embrace the idea of mindfulness and use that as a tool to achieve the goals of the therapy, acceptance commitment therapy, in, in, you know, comes to mind in particular, and dialectical behavior therapy as well would be the two most prominent components. But then there's a whole bunch of other mindfulness-based, you know, mindfulness-based CBT and all that sort of stuff as well. The interesting thing is that, and I actually kind of, like, I think that mindfulness, more specifically, I think that Eastern philosophies mm. have, like, a tremendous amount of benefit. My problem with it is that if you actually think about the teachings of Buddha it, and the teachings of Buddhist religions now, it actually kind of is, in some sense, like like the holy grail because for them reaching nirvana reaching the state of like perfect tranquility with the world where nothing can affect you is kind of like the peak summit of mm. meditative experience mm. Mm. and once you've reached there you escape the cycle of mm. birth and death and <clears throat> rebirth and rebirth and you escape suffering and you escape karma mm. And in my own personal experiences, like, and and obviously there's people that like do meditation and they reach states of reach states of that tremendous tranquility. Like they they do. I'm not sure if they get all the way there. I'm not sure if they, you know, break the cycle of birth and death mm. or are truly completely unaffected by anything. There's some really interesting case studies in that. But in my own personal experience, meditation, mindfulness, Eastern philosophies certainly can help you deal with suffering and things that have like gone wrong or things that you're not appreciating or things that you're got in, having a negative effect from. But I also think that it can go too far where it allows you to just sit with experiences when you should be out there doing something about the experience mm. Mm. or even in cases and I like I know the obvious answer to that is it, it shouldn't stop you from going out there um, and changing things when you can change them but sometimes I also think that there can be there can be benefit to fighting a fight that 
you know that you can't win anyway. Like, and, mm. and it's something to me, there's something like almost like mm. therapeutic of like being up against it. You're, you're not going to change the suffering that you're mm. in now, but like you can still contend with the world and contend mm. with the reality of your situation. It's like, I'm not sure mm. to the extent, like, like where do you see that like balance lying in your like therapeutic practices when you use those therapies that you listed, which incorporate the mindfulness, mm. like to what extent are you like, to what extent is it a tool and to what extent do you think it can go too far, if it can go too far at all? Yeah, really good question. I think I would say that if you're coming at it from a acceptance and commitment therapy perspective, then... Can you just quickly expand sure, on that? Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. So the, the main focus of acceptance and commitment therapy is not to address symptoms so you're not looking to say somebody's coming in with depression you're not looking to improve the depression what you're looking for is to help them live a more valued life and more meaningful life and addressing the barriers that are coming up um, for the person to be able to live that way and the, the, the depression will obviously be a you know, big barrier for that person um, so essentially that's in a, it in a nutshell really um, and so from that perspective, you would say, okay, what behaviors you want to see, what you're encouraging the person to do is whatever behavior would be consistent with what they value, what's meaningful to them. So for you, fighting the fight, even if it's a losing fight, is meaningful. So you would be using mindfulness as a way of helping a person engage with that behavior despite all the, the, the I guess, the internal experiences that would discourage them from doing that whether that's you know self-talk around this is pointless what's the you know it's useless you're not going to go anywhere you're just going to fail all that sort of stuff um or even the emotional experiences you know the despair that you might experience when you're fighting a losing fight or something like that it's about being able to sit with those experiences but not allow them to dictate what you do you know so does that kind of clear yeah, that yeah. up a bit I'm not sure how that fits with Buddhist philosophy because I guess my practice of meditation is probably more grounded in uh, those models of therapy as opposed to a spiritual kind of practice. Um, so I'm not sure what Buddhists would say about that. It's kind of interesting because like, I guess what we've kind of done or what you've just done then is kind of like in some sense – like they're obviously going to be interconnected, but in some sense you can separate the spiritual and the philosophical mm. from the like psychological mm. and you can get like psychological benefits out of the philosophical without necessarily mm. taking all of the philosophical mm. expanding beyond Eastern religion. To what extent do you see philosophical underpinnings a in and i've already asked a similar question but the extent to which you see philosophical underpinnings in a the treatment of psychological diseases and b the actual psychological disease itself is psychological disease the right term or i yeah i get I'm not entirely sure about what's the right language these days. I think I just use mental health concerns, I guess. Um, I think you might get people who are medically trained that might not see them as diseases. I guess it depends on what condition we're talking about as well. Um, but I guess that's a semantic, yeah. you know, argument. <laughs> I just, I just don't want to. Don't want to. I don't. Anymore. I don't want to be insensitive. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, what extent do you see? philosophical underpinnings in those mental health concerns and in the treatment mm. of them? I'd say that something that, I, that I've been thinking about lately is the ideas of the self. And I'm, this isn't so much kind of tacked on to, um, you know, nihilism and stuff that I thought that you might have been, um, you know, getting at. But... It's certainly something that I've found quite interesting thinking about what actually is the self. And I guess in psychotherapy, and a lot of psychotherapies, you're, you're not looking at oneself, you're looking at a person's collection of selves, right? 
um, which goes against our internal experience, but is kind of in a way you're looking to in probably that will definitely in a lot of forms of therapy, whether they directly name it or not, this isn't certainly comes up that this idea that we are not just one being. So I guess in a, a form of therapy called schema therapy, we talk about modes that we that we're in, you know, at any particular moment, which is a mode is kind of just like your state of being in that moment, right? Um, and you know, a lot of you, we kind of make the connection in schema therapy between those and your personal history, you know, your experiences growing up and, you know, the way that we internalize those early experiences um, and how they then, you know, manifest in our everyday lives currently. But there's a form of therapy like DBT or dialectical behavior therapy that kind of looks at the self as one of three cells. You've got your emotion mind, you've got your rational mind and your wise mind. And what we're trying to do is build this wise mind that is, I guess, the best of both worlds in a way. Yeah, so um, this is awesome because the last podcast that I released, I talked about like almost exactly what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So like to give a very, very brief overview, Plato saw three parts to the soul. Mm-hmm. Um, man, like strikingly similar to what you just mm-hmm. said. Um, mm-hmm. He classifies it as reason, spirit, and appetites, mm-hmm. which you could kind of see as like emotional drives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think just in general, we all need to accept the fact that we have lots of different practical identities. Mm. I'm a university student. I'm also a son. Mm. Um, on very rare occasions, I'm a sportsman. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily a great one, but... Uh, like that, that's, a that's, metal wearing sportsman <laughs> that is one of the you know practical identities that I have and we are taken in different directions by those practical different. identities at one moment in time and across an extended period of time mm-hmm. and something has to be said for the need to unify them mm-hmm. into one mm-hmm. collective mm-hmm. whole yeah can I just come in on that yes, point as well and do. I guess this is what's really interesting to me is that I guess some something that you get from more mindfulness or or meditative practices and particularly when it's rooted in Buddhism is this idea that there is no self you know and and you kind of you you recognize it you realize that and in doing that it alleviates a lot of suffering this idea that there is no self but then if you look at say personality disorders uh, or people that you know, have complex post-traumatic stress disorder. One of the things that's, I guess, diagnostic for them is this chronic lack of self, you know what I mean? So on one end, you're kind of getting to the space of no self and that's a really healthy thing and it helps you alleviate a lot of suffering. I guess another way of talking about it is being that observing self, you know, and just, um, but then, but at the same token, that can be what we classify as disordered as well. Well, that's like jumping into what I said before because, like, and that's almost exactly one of my concerns. Like, it seems to be a point where this no self doctrine can become pathological. Um, like, if understood that way, mm. to be like generous to those doctrines, though, like, I think you could interpret the doctrine of no self when you start understanding where that idea has come from Mm. it's come from the idea of that what we are is just a collection of our like perceptions and Mm -hmm. our experiences and you could say that like you know one of your like practical identities Mm -hmm. or one of the parts of you is like also just like another one of those like Mm -hmm. perception things that you perceive or things that you experience and it would be interesting someone should someone should do a thesis on this interesting to the extent to which you can take that idea but not be left with something that's empty at the end mm. because I, I don't think that like 
I, I mean, I don't have any understanding of the psychological mm. disorders where you don't have this sense of self. But I think the like the Buddhist response to that would be, that's not the sort of no self we're talking about. Yeah. Um, it's not like an absence of an absence of anything. Mm. It's mm. a like awareness that like in some sense your self is constructed Mm -hmm. and also and i like this is where i kind of like have been starting to jump off board with my thinking recently there's nothing over and above the parts and i i like want to say that there is but Mm. i think that's kind of where the buddhist doctrine would go yes i'm not sure if that's like the sort of no self that or lack of sense of self that you would see in psychological disorders I think the key distinction that you're making there is that it's not, you're not making that realization or that awareness from the standpoint of not having a self. You're making that, you're having that realization and awareness, but then you're returning to the side, this experience of the self. You know what I mean? As opposed to, I guess, an, a complete absence of that or, you know, very much an absence of that. But I think interestingly, you would. Arguably, you could say that the leading form of therapy or the most evidence-based form of therapy for um, borderline personality disorder, for example, uh, which you know is a condition that is marked by that lack of sense of self, um, is DBT or dialectical behavior therapy. It's one of the leading, I wouldn't say necessarily the most evidence-based, but it is certainly one of the, the major ones. And a core tenet of that is mindfulness practice and is awareness. But I guess thinking about it now, you're doing that, but you're also within that model talking about the emotional mind, rational mind and wise mind. So I guess in a way you're, there's almost like you're trying to give the person that sense of self, you know, through that concept, perhaps. I'm not sure. So like, because, like, the, the question that I asked a while ago was, like, the extent to which there's a connection between philosophy and psychology. Yeah. And it yeah. just seems, like, striking to me now yeah, that there yeah. might be. Yeah. Um, it sort of it filters through a lot, you know. It's... There's... This is not really a form of therapy that I have a lot of experience with or know a lot about, but there is, you know, a form of therapy that we'll call existential therapy. And so... And my limited understanding around that form of therapy is that it does borrow very heavily from ideas of existentialist philosophy. Could be wrong, don't quote me on that, but I, there, is, it's, there is this filtration effect of form of thinking that kind of goes into things. And I guess, you know, you're looking at modern forms of therapy and how they're borrowing from Buddhist ideas and finding that sort of stuff useful. The other thing I guess I would say as well is if you take it right back to say Socrates, you know, and thinking about how we know what we know and how we form a belief in a way, that's really one of the fundamental aspects of psychology and psychotherapy. You're trying to help a person develop different beliefs about themselves, about the world. And I guess trying to understand rationalism, you know, and, that I guess forms of therapy that are a bit more cognitive in nature, like cognitive therapy or cognitive behavior therapy, where you're kind of looking at specifically what thoughts a person is having and you're looking at what thoughts are rational thoughts and one, what thoughts are not rational thoughts and challenging them. It just, there is even a technique within that form of therapy called Socratic questioning, you know, <laughs> which is sort of embodying that, that spirit of Socrates, you know, in, in your questioning the person to try to make, help them to make those connections you know okay um, so i mean i need to jump in here because yeah. there's 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 <laughs> okay. like seven things that i want to say um i'm gonna list them both and i want you to take one of them sure so <laughs> the first one is i've been studying philosophy for a while now and you go down rabbit holes in yeah. philosophy <laughs> and And there can be some sort of like disorientating effect to that. Now, I think I personally have been pretty lucky because I get like disorientated for a while and then I feel like I come out at the other end stronger. Mm -hmm. But 
in many cases there is that disorientating effect Mm -hmm. and so like I've kind of become not used to but like I, I can understand like feelings of like existential sort of like dread like existential anxiety concerns about like the nature of evil and why it exists and you know how we can confront that and what's good and what's bad like just like basic kind of like life things that like we need to like sort of like orientate ourselves to like go upwards Mm. then what like what I would be interested to hear from you is the sort of like extent to which psychological diseases are kind of the same thing like whether they're like whether it's that thinking taken to an extreme or whether like whether it's that problem to an extreme or whether it's actually like a distinct problem Mm. like whether it's like there's some sort of and there probably is like some sort of like biological component that's actually just distinct from the thinking Mm. like what do you think about that I think it depends a bit from person to person. Um, And I think because essentially, now you correct me if I'm wrong around this, but essentially the way that I sort of view philosophy is, I guess one of its functions is to understand what it means to be human and what it means to live a good life or in how we should, who we are and how we should be. That's certainly what I want philosophy to be. Yeah. 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 And you're talking about human experience. So the things that you'll be bumping into are things that whether people are conscious of them or not are still part of the human condition. So in a way it's, I think probably, you know, there's no way you could tease the two apart. I think they're just fundamentally integrated and that sometimes they'll be more conscious and more present, but other times they won't be. I guess when we're talking about, you know, problems of, of evil, for example, when you think about how people respond to trauma and, and when very horrible things have been done to them, you know, um, I guess you're still on some level, whether it's conscious or not, grappling with that concept in some way. And I guess when people find meaning or they, they heal from those experiences, often they do find meaning in it. You know, and that's not saying what happened was okay or anything like that, but it's it's quite an empowering experience. Well, like I've certainly found in my own life that even seriously, even now compared to twelve months ago, I feel like I'm way better at handling things when things go badly. Mm. Like, and that doesn't mean that like I'm like fucking Buddha when <laughs> someone pisses me off. Like, I get just as angry as the next bloke. But I think when you go and separate yourself from the situation and think about it you certainly become more capable of dealing with it now I've got to hinge on to my second thing that I wanted to say mm-hmm. you talked about Socratic questioning mm-hmm. and there's actually two things I want to say about this mm-hmm. firstly it seems to me that like do you need to ask those questions but there can also be a time when you're asking too many questions. Absolutely. And and secondly, when we start asking these questions, um, especially like, I guess, in a therapeutic relationship, if someone's asking these questions, you know, like, why did this trauma happen to me? You know, why is this evil exist? Why, you know, why is there like no purpose to life or is there a purpose to life? And then th- you know, they start formulating answers to those questions. To what extent does it matter that their answers, A, are true, and B, kind of like agree with the current thinking of society? So there's a lot yeah. there. Yeah, take, there, take, there take is. your pick. There is. Um, so I'll start with the last bit and then I'll try and work back, I guess. Um, I guess, and I think my psychologist would respond the same way as well I think most of us would say that what we're interested in is what's helpful and if a person takes something from an experience and that helps them live a fully actualized life helps them recover from whatever 
issue they were dealing with and actually authentically recover from it because we can adopt all sorts of ways of thinking that put a band-aid on a, on a much deeper issue. Um, but if, if it authentically helps that person, I don't think it matters whether it's true or not at the end of the day. Um, and I don't think most people would would disagree. Like, I don't think psychologists would disagree with that. I think most people would respond that way. I think coming back to the earlier point about when's too much questioning, you're right. Like when I when I hear or when I when I hear, when I read about what it sounds like Socrates was like as a person, he sounds infuriating. Like he just sounds like not the sort of person that you want to have around because he's constantly questioning everything about you and just well, gets I tired. mean, the Greeks did end up putting him to death. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> um, so, and I guess the, what when that can become frustrating is when, I guess when you're being questioned when you're not asking to be questioned and also when you're when you're engaging too much with the cognitive in that something one of the biggest complaints about cognitive therapy and cognitive behavior therapy in particular and one of the reasons why other forms of therapy like dialectical behavior therapy and um, acceptance commitment therapy and schema therapy kind of develop uh, um, in response to that was this idea that if we're so focused on that we can the experience of it can be very invalidating for clients and if you're sitting there and you you know it's not what you're trying to do but the experience can be from the client's perspective that you know you're just thinking wrong and if you just think right you'll be better you know and how can you not see and the fact is that we're we're irrational beings you know and our emotional mind is driving us a lot of the time and sometimes what a person is looking for and you you might notice this in your personal relationships as well when somebody is distressed and they might be talking about some a whole bunch of irrational stuff what they're actually really needing to hear is validation you know they're needing to hear the the to, they're needing to feel understood and heard and listened to and then you can get to the other stuff after but if you don't respond to that emotional need then the person isn't going to be soothed and they're not going to be helped as a result of that so absolutely I think in the therapy space you I once had a supervisor describe therapy as an art and a science in that the science is the you know doing all the academic research as to what the forms of therapy are helpful and how and yada 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 um, but the, the art to it is actually understanding how you can use that knowledge for that person that's in front of you and respond to them in that moment in a way that's going to be useful and time and time again what's useful is just being really real and really authentic with the person so what you're touching on now is kind of like the sort of it's both an art and a science basically says to me that psychology is more than a science and Mm. there's certain aspects that science can't capture so like I want to talk about consciousness for a second Mm -hmm. because the current thinking with consciousness is we can study the shit out of it scientifically Mm -hmm. but in the end there's going to be something about your conscious experience that I can't understand scientifically Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in fact I can't understand it in any particular way so I could learn every single thing there is about the neurons firing in your brain right now but presumably like I would also learn something different if I literally adopted your conscious experience. Mm -hmm. So there's some sort of like unbridgeable separation between your conscious experience and my understanding of that conscious experience in the therapeutic relationship. You've got people coming in with different experiences all the time and there are going to be experiences, you know, that you haven't had, obviously, because you're Different. not that person. So to what extent do you feel like you can kind of bridge that gap and, like, un- like really understand where mm. that person's, like, experiences are coming from? And, like, well, you can answer that one first, but, like, on top of that, given that, like, I doubt that we're, I mean it's self-evident that you're never going to bridge the gap completely. Yeah. Um, what 
can you do? Like, what, mm. what's the best that you can do in that scenario? Yeah, really good question. And I would agree that you just got to throw out the idea that you're ever actually going to truly understand. And if you come across like you do, or that's what you're trying to do, then it's not going to come across well, you know, because the person's going to be you don't, you don't know me, you don't get what it's like for me. So I guess it's about adopting communication that you're, that you're feeling for that person, you know, that you're, you're hearing what they're saying and you're trying to take it on and understand as best as you can. And you're sitting with it and you're uh, providing compassion to that person. So I guess you're looking out for that emotional need. And do you let them know that that you, even though you're trying, you're not capturing, like you're never going to completely capture their experience? Mm. Because they're kind of seen, it, like in some sense, it seems disingenuous to me mm. when people say like, oh, I understand what you're going through. Mm. And like, I know mm. that. And so it's Quite like... Quite invalidating thing to say to somebody. Yes. Yeah, so, so like... <laughs> How can you show someone that you are sympathetic? And I mean, this has got to be applied to like every single sort of interpersonal relationship. Yeah, for sure. How can you show someone that you're sympathetic whilst l- making sure they understand that their conscious experience is their conscious experience and you aren't actually going to completely understand it? Yeah. So, Marsha Linehan, who is the the, I guess the person who is most responsible for dialectical behavior therapy talks about there being six levels of validation. And if you're engaging in that, then the person is going to feel heard and understood. And the level, I, can't, I won't be able to list them all off you know, perfectly, but essentially it starts from you know, the first level is about just physically attending to the person, looking at them, making eye contact, just those non-verbals. Then it's about you know, paraphrasing and, and reflecting back what you're hearing. You, you don't even have to agree with what the person's saying. You're just reflecting that you're hearing what they're saying. Um, and then, you know, you can go down to deeper levels. Like you can, you can take what your the messages that you're getting sent, whether it's, whether they're direct conscious messages that the person, you know, through what the person is saying, or it might be just what you're picking up from their body language and what they're feeling, you know, and the emotional message that they're sending to you, as well as the, the I guess, the cognitive message. Um, you can take that, reflect that back to them as you can sort of like normalize and understand more, you know, of course that makes sense that you would think X, Y, and Z, or you would feel X, Y, and Z given ABC, you know. You're not even agreeing with it. You're not even saying that you agree that the person is thinking in a rational way or that their response was perfectly, you know, proportional to the triggering event. You're just simply acknowledging that that's what happened. And you can understand or you could, you can understand how that person would experience that given their, their, their history or their background or everything that goes into that moment. So is that kind of, answering yeah, that to yeah. an extent and it's the six levels are just like you know starting from the superficial down to the deeper levels the way that you can do that but i guess i would say that providing that validation for the person is what people are looking for they're not necessarily looking for you to truly 100 percent embody their experience is it the sort of thing that i mean i've kind of in reflection of my own interactions mm-hmm. the sort of thing that i feel like can help people and please tell me if I'm fucking up um, <laughs> the sort of things that I think can help people is saying things like oh yeah you know someone says like oh so angry and you say like yeah and your like car got shat on by a bird and yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's things like that which is yeah, like kind yeah. of explaining almost to them yeah. why they would be angry yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is that kind of what you're, you're saying yeah but I think the other thing to that as well is that you're demonstrating to the person that you've been that you're listening to them mm. and when you're listening to them then you must value them you must care about them you know and that's a nice feeling to have you know when you're distressed to feel like somebody actually cares is actually taking their time to listen to you and and even if they don't know how to support you, just wanting to support you, wanting to find... Because sometimes there is nothing that you can say that will make that situation better. 
you know, and sometimes just simply acknowledging there's nothing that I can say right now. Um, but I wish, I wish there was something I could do. I wish there was something that I could say to make this better or, um, you know, just simply by acknowledging that there is nothing to say that can feel really validating for a person. And I guess where that comes up the most is like around bereavement where somebody dies and it's just shit, you know, it's just really, really shit. And just one of the worst things that we have to experience as human beings, uh, and there is nothing that you can say to that person in that moment that's going to make them feel better. But that's not the point. What's going to help them process that experience and help them not be so overwhelmed or burdened by it is the understanding that you're, you care for them and you're there to help them in any way that you can, even if it's just by spending time and showing that you're listening to them or... or um, wanting to yeah so like Nietzsche kind of Nietzsche was interested in suffering as some sort of aesthetic phenomenon Mm -hmm. which is I mean he often sounds like a dick (laughs) and and I think that lots of people would interpret this sort of thing as him being a dick yeah Um, because you know he says sort of thing like your friend's suffering like let them suffer like Mm, quite literally mm, mm. and i mean there's sort of one way to think about that which i won't get into now is some sort of aesthetic Mm. experience for that person but i think another sort of like bastardized version but sort of sweeter version of that is to understand that like when a person comes to you with a problem they're not always wanting you to solve the problem (laughs) like you know like and sometimes the problem's gonna be unsolvable and you literally just need to like be like yeah that's fucking shit and like sometimes shit's just shit yeah so I think that makes what that makes me think about is it's not the what it's the how that's important so you know if you say use that example of somebody who's passed away and you know, your friend's distressed and you, you just send him a text and be like, that really sucks. Um, I don't know what to say. And you leave it like that and don't respond to them or connect with them. Or if you do that in person and you just say, oh, that's, you know, that's really terrible and just leave them. Like, that's not going to be very valid and it's not going to be very helpful. But if you do that from that place of genuinely wanting to be compassionate to that person and caring for them and and sitting and almost sharing the the emotional burden as much as you can, you know. Um, I think, and being open to that suffering with that person, you know, I think that's going to be more helpful than, um, yeah, than not, not doing that. So I think, to kind of bring it back to, I think it's the what, sorry, it's the how rather than the what you're doing. So with nature, they're saying, you know, um, suffering is just suffering. You can do that from the perspective of suffering, suffering, get over it, you know, which is not a very compassionate which is feeling why response. you might think he's a dick, but yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're reading it from that angle and that's how it sounds to you, definitely you'd think, well, this guy's, you know, um, got no empathy. Uh, but if you're helping that person suffer by, you know, sharing it with them, and sitting in the muck with that person, then that's that's a compassionate response. And you're not necessarily trying to take, you're not trying to stop the person from suffering, but you're just trying to, I guess, be with them in their suffering as much as possible. And that in a way has a, a way of, you know, at times sharing the burden and creating this sense of universality, you know, I guess particularly if it's a shared loss, you know, if we're talking in the context of grief. But if it's not that, just the the connecting with that person and showing that they're, they're valued and cared for can itself start to help that person soothe that distress. And then from there you can, if it's appropriate, be looking at fixing the problem. So like, my mind kind of went on a little bit of a tangent listening to you mm-hmm. there and I'm going to kind of take you down that tangent and sure. I'm interested to hear what you think about this. So like you, you were talking about grief and loss 
and I was I was listening to you, yeah. and I was also I was also simultaneously thinking about how life experiences like that, but also you know other sorts of traumatic experiences, can lead to psychological mental health issues. Yeah, and I was thinking because often it's easy when like you're looking. I mean, I don't know, but I can imagine sometimes you can look at you know, certain mental health conditions, like especially like things like post-traumatic stress, and you'd just be able to go like, this is the event that triggered mm, that. Mm, mm. Um, to what extent do you see those sorts of psychological conditions as being a result of those sorts of experiences and of, say, biology? And to what extent do you think that, like, a person is, I guess, free to not... Um, develop that condition to kind of like mitigate or prevent it somehow Mm. awesome question so that could be a two hour conversation potentially but the short version I guess the way that I like to think about it is that there are things that you know are always going to be good for you but don't protect you from all illnesses like for example you know exercise and good diet is good advice for everyone in, you know, no matter what situation they're in. And that's mostly going to be really useful in helping a person avoid most diseases. But every now and again, there is going to be somebody who will have a heart attack, you know, due to genetic issues, or they will have never smoked in their life, but still get lung cancer. You know what I mean? So it's, that doesn't mean that those efforts aren't helpful because for most people, they're going a long way, you know, to helping them live a healthy lifestyle and avoid any kind of um, physical disease. But that's not every person. And I think mental health is similar in that there are things that, you know, if you could control every variable around a person's life, hypothetically, you probably could go a long way to preventing that person from developing any kind of psychological disorder. But if you don't control their genes, you know, eventually, you know, that's not going to be a perfect thing. So there, and it also depends on the condition. I think my understanding of say depression, um, is that I think the most recent research puts it at about 40% genetic risk and 60% environmental somewhere in that sort of ballpark. So there's a huge amount that you can do behaviorally to avoid mental health conditions, but it's not perfect. Um, But it also, I guess, touches on the idea of free will and determinism. Yeah. Okay. So, (laughs) so I want to, this is, this is what I was going to say. So, and this is the the path we were were about to go down um, very, rather implicitly or now explicitly. (laughs) So like the question I kind of asked you there was, you know, to what extent is someone's psychological condition really like whether it's one that we would like consider um, to be abnormal in a negative way or even abnormal in a positive way or just, you know, kind of more towards the average average person to the extent that that body exists. Yeah. Um, to what extent your experiences your actions are like really yours um Mm, whether there's mm. really you that's like behind it that's caused it or whether Mm. it's just a product of like you know deterministic factors that have extended like you know thousands and thousands of years Mm -hmm. before you and Mm -hmm. are gonna like continue into the future and i mean like like you said like i mean that's not a that's not a topic of just a two hour podcast that's that's literally a topic of you know thousands of years of debate we've already had and haven't really gotten anywhere yeah so what i'm like interested i guess to hear from you is not like the truth value yeah. of determinism yeah but more like if someone c- comes to you with um a mental health condition or even just you know like you're talking to someone who's like having a rough time of it to what extent do they need to understand that what they're suffering is kind of like a product of 
you know, their environment and their genes and in some sense is like beyond their control mm. and to what extent like and, and to when does that sort of thinking get dangerous because we don't mm. want to just like put everything, you know, outside of our control and start, you know, thinking that there's nothing that I can do and, mm. and those sorts mm. of like mm. pathological ways of thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really good question. Um, and I guess it also kind of comes back to when I, when you ask me what effects, do, you know, what effects are there on psychologists practicing psych, psychotherapy? And um, my response was that it increases your empathy. I think part of the reason why it does increase your empathy is that you have a better understanding of deterministic factors that go into whatever behavior you're seeing. So, you know, from the psychological perspective, you might see somebody who is highly critical of others and very narcissistic as a projection or a compensation from for really low self-esteem or, or, or you know a number of factors that might have gone into that specific behavior if you don't have that training background you just kind of see that well that person's a dick you know what i mean and you just you don't go any further than that um but i'm sorry i digress but i guess coming back to the idea of you know what's helpful and what's not you are kind of balancing this idea of understanding why you experience what you're experiencing while maintaining the hope that that can be different in any given moment in terms of how you do that how you you sort of make that balance I'm not sure how I do that I think it's just something that you know you portray I guess it's there are times where somebody might be not really experiencing much hope, but I guess I draw from experiences working with other clients and seeing the changes that they've been able to make or just the little stories that you hear from from in everyday life. You, you don't know where a person's story is gonna go. You just have no idea where it's gonna go, even if it's determined, even if it's, everything is predetermined. You still don't know where that person's life is going to go because there are just too many variables that are in play. And in a way, you know, I guess there's a few things with this. I think one idea is that it doesn't matter so much what a person thinks, it's about how that operates and how that functions for them. So whether a person believes in determinism or not, it's well, what the, the really important question is, well, how does that belief affect your life? Yeah, how do you interpret that belief? Yeah. How, do, how do you act with regards yes. to that belief? Yeah. And that can be positive and that can be, it, it can be negative. So I think that's the kind of a more important question. Um, I think if I was to put my philosopher hat on for a moment, I would think that, I guess I would say, the scientist in me says that everything is predetermined. It's, you know, everything's predetermined. But... I guess when I put on another hat, I think, well, why do we even have consciousness then? You know, what's the point of consciousness? If everything that we, everything about us as human beings has some sort of connection to some sort of evolutionary purpose, then presuming that um, consciousness has a connection to some sort of evolutionary benefit as well. And, you know, it just seems to me that consciousness could I don't know if I agree with this or not but could be a way of you know subverting that deterministic yeah um, like kind of factors I mean there's there's heaps of ideas about this stuff one of the ideas that I've recently encountered is that self-consciousness creates some sort of what the author of this book referred to as reflective distance mm-hmm. where it kind of creates a distance between us and sort of like our natural like animalistic instincts and that distance allows us to like apply reason and other yep. sorts of like principles of rationality to them so that they're not de- like determine our behavior mm-hmm. my personal stance on the like determinism free will debate at least at the moment and like everything is probably subject to change is that like why bother trying like it's like Mm, mm. it's a like most metaphysical questions it's just like a fucking really difficult question Um, (laughs) like we've been asking the same question for thousands of years and like 
we could probably make a better judgment by like flipping a coin. Yeah. I was just, yeah, really, really interested because I can totally imagine that underlying or like being some like being like included in lots of like psychological treatments in a really really subtle way Mm. um that sort of debate between like yeah like were you free to do what you do or were you not free to do what you do like incorporated into psychology Mm. and i guess the way i try to think about free will now just like in my life kind of like independent of sort of whether it's you know true or not is is like this um i think we need to understand that environmental factors and internal factors that a person never chose that a person was mere you know subject to often determine in in at some sense or is reason for a person to be a particular way Mm -hmm. but that person still needs to be free to you know act and determine themselves and go out in the world Mm. And, yeah, where that free will would come from or how it would work is a question beyond me. But, yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, and I I guess you also also think about... The psychologist in me now kind of thinks about reinforcement. And I guess if you're looking at determinism, you can apply the principles of behaviourism to kind of explain any given behaviour in any given moment if you had sufficient information about the person. And... I guess what you're trying to do is help that person, whether they're consciously, do, whether they whether they have the choice to do it or not, um, bump into new experiences of reinforcement of different things. You know what I mean? So, and I guess that comes back to how can you hold hope if there's you know determinism in that? Well, every second there's a whole host of influences. And so many variables that are going into every given moment that could have such a profound impact on that person and you can't predict that so you even if you might consciously predict where something's going there's no reason why you actually because you just, the human brain just simply cannot hold that those many variables in place I think that I guess leaning on say I keep talking about acceptance and commitment therapy but I just think it's sort of most that form of therapy is most uh, uh, aligned with philosophy, um, particularly Buddhist philosophy. Um, but in that space, what you're kind of trying to achieve is when I said before about you're trying to help that person engage with a meaningful life and display or engage with behaviors that are going to be helpful and functional um, for the purpose of them living a mean, living a meaningful life, despite whatever the internal experience may be you're kind of essentially teaching that person to sit with all that predetermined experience that goes into whatever thought they might be having, whatever emotion they might be having, and then trying to get around that or step over that by detaching from that experience, doing it mindfully, and then engaging with something else. So in a way, it's like you're exercising free will. But then again... (laughs) You would say, well, that's just predetermined as well. That, yeah. So, yeah. Well, anyway, like, that's, that's yeah. probably not a fruitful area for us to go down. <laughs> um, I mean, big, big questions. Mm. And, I mean, I don't want to fry your brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think we, we'll stop that there. Yeah, sure. I'm, I have to say I'm kind of disappointed because, I mean, like, this has been an awesome conversation. Cool, I really enjoyed I've, it too. I've, uh, I was kind of disappointed because, obviously, right now you're working in substance use disorders. Yes. And I'm really, really interested to hear not just kind of, like, the psychology behind it, but also kind of, like, the politics and the political philosophy mm. that underlies those things. And that basically just means that you're going to have to come back on. Yeah, (laughs) I'll be more than happy to. (laughs) Thank you for coming on. You're very welcome, Tim. I really enjoyed it.